myself and how I uh, groom myself and uh, produce myself um, consciously is in the persona. But what about the rest? And is there a rest? Well, the rest in the Jungian uh, terminology is the shadow. Mm. Now, uh, you know, shadow from a, from a perspective of physics, we stand in the light, the light shines on us, and, the, and what the light shines on, we can say is our person, uh, personality or our persona, but it must leave a shadow. And Chris, the, just, just on shadow, there's, there's a yes. common perception, I think, that shadow is a negative. Yes. That's not the case, though, is it? Not at all. Um, often, often it is, but not, not by any means universally. The shadow is that which has been neglected, mm. suppressed or undeveloped. Yep. That which has been forced out of consciousness or we've made a, uh, a pact with ourselves to suppress it. That can be anything. Mm. In, a, in a very pragmatic family, that can be our creativity, which has been, you know, get a real job put those drawing books away and you know go out and go out and you know get your plumber's ticket mm. where does the creativity go into the unconscious it's suppressed because i'm punished if i persist in that so create that's one of many many examples of something which is out of sight out of awareness um out of consciousness but which is which is not at all uh, negative or evil to use its uh, archetypal uh, terminology Likewise, um, shadow is formed mainly out of our experiences with our primary caregivers and our family of origin. Now, we can, you know, we can talk later about how much we bring in or collective shadow and those kind of things. But in psychological terms, we, we, uh, uh, we arrive and we are demonstrably expressive. We wish to express, we wish to love, we wish to create, we wish to follow our instincts, uh, a very broad range of instincts. Some of those instincts meet with approval, a lot of them don't. And they're not only disapproval, but sanctions. We're punished, mm. we're ridiculed, we're criticised, we're humiliated. It doesn't take long for a very expressive organism by, pro by a process of negative reinforcement or by a process of punishment to say, I think I'll just skip that from the program for the moment and put it out of sight. Chris, do you and think so, that what that reminds me of is hmm. um, something that we often say within the men's group that, um, you know, blokes, boys, you know, when, when up until the age of, say, five, they're very free and open with their emotions, typically. Yes. And when they hit the, uh, the schoolyard, they get policed and, um, you know, um, encouraged not to be emotional and to not share their emotions. Sure. And we, you know, we say it's like an emotional straitjacket, this, this collective sort of masculine script in, in Western culture and in Australia in particular. Definitely. And that's a, um, that's what it seems to me is that that's a dimension of those natural capacities within ourselves that are, that are suppressed and um, kept hidden and, and um, in, perhaps in part of shadow. Almost certainly, almost certainly, Dave. My personal feeling is it starts before that. Mm. My personal feeling is it, it incorporates the value system of the family of origin. Sure. Uh, and it's reinforced by bumping into a whole uh, bunch of kids who have similar fa families of origin with those kind of values and reinforced by the education system, which sort of uh, encourages certain shapes mm. of, ma of the masculine and the feminine. But to add to the difficulties, it's not just um, what my mum and dad consciously don't like, it's what their unconscious value system is, which makes it even more mm. obscure. That is, okay, don't drown your sister in the toilet. I get that, you know, we can, we can you know, uh, disapprove of that and we can sanction that, but um, don't, don't be emotionally expressive. Um, uh, that may come with a apparently liberal parenting. But what's, what's in the unconscious of mum and dad is their own Seventh-day Adventist upbringing. Mm. Uh, and they're trying to be different. But in the unconscious, they're just as strict and, and uh, restrictive as, as someone else. So we're dealing with what the conscious and unconscious value system of the parents are. And then, of course, the education system and their peer groups and so on. Mm. So what, 
the causes are fairly powerful. We've got, you know, we've got a, an entire culture, a Western culture, which says this is what men do and this is what they don't do. Mm. This is what women do and they uh, shouldn't do. And this is what men do to women. And this is what w women do with men. And that's been around for 2000 years. And we're starting to make some inroads into it now, but it's still very powerful, as you know, as, as everyone listening knows. Yeah. So um, whatever our family of origin um, shape was, um, the rest of it is hacked away from us and disappears into the darkness. And that's what we bring into our uh, socialization when we become six and seven and start forming groups and learning to have friends and so on. And that's what we take into adolescence and that's what we take into our adult lives. So we are partial. We are partial organisms. Now it would be nice if what went into the darkness disappears from lack mm. of light, like the seedlings in our greenhouse at the moment, which aren't going too well from lack of light but it doesn't work that way. In fact, it's more of a mushroom than it is of a, a Brussels sprout. It grows in the darkness. Mm. It accumulates in the darkness and it creates pressure. And when, when what we don't know about ourselves creates pressure, it means that we have to devote more resources to keeping it under wraps. Mm. And the more resources we devote to keeping it under wraps, the less we have for our conscious creativity and relational life and spiritual life. If half of the troops are sitting on the, sitting on the, on the cover of the mine, well, there's only half the troops that can go forward and, and create and relate. Mm. So the more there is in shadow, un, uh, unreconstituted, unworked, the less we have available for ourselves. The less we have available for ourselves over time, the less happy we become. Until we reach a sort of point in our, our life, you know, it might be in our 40s or 50s, where we start to run out of juice and also run out of hope. Mm -hmm. Hope for the future that we uh, imagined for ourselves, hope for the future that we thought was possible and knew was possible. Is that, um, is that stage? what some would call a midlife crisis, midlife transition, you know, what the hell am I doing? What, what am I here for? Why am I doing this job that I hate? Yes. You know, it certainly shows up. It can show up about that time. And it's certainly part of, part of that parcel. Hmm. Um, so, uh, that's why we end up in a men's group. Well, that's one, one of the reasons, <laughs> you know, because, uh, I've had the electrics checked out, but I'm still only running on five cylinders and yeah. I just can't get full throttle here. Something or, right. I'm, or I'm desperately unhappy. Mm. You can go to that. Mm. So the question for us when we're trying to work with this, and, you know, again, this is, I'm not preaching to you, you all know this, or I'm just putting it into my words. How do we know um, what is in the unconscious if it is unconscious, mm. if we don't know? We have this kind of way of kind of being nice to ourselves to say, well, yeah, there's stuff in the unconscious. Yep, yep, I've got an unconscious. Yeah, I've got a rough idea what it's like. You know, yeah, a bit of this and a bit of that. Bullshit. We don't know. That's the issue. We do not know. I can't say it enough from my own experience, from the experience of others. So if we don't know what, what's there, how are we going to ever get hold of its tail and give it a pull to see if we can bring it into the light? Mm. Well, traditionally, or psychologically speaking, there's a couple of ways. One of the ways is our dreams, by paying attention to our dreams. And we can talk about that uh, in a minute, mm. a bit. Um, another way in which we can get hold of the sense of what's in the unconscious, what has been repressed into shadow is a really big reaction, a disproportionate reaction to characteristics or behaviors that we see in others. Yeah. Um, now this, I've always found this a puzzle. It's, tr it's true, unfortunately, but I've always found it a puzzle. It's like, I see someone being cruel, hmm. um, uh, lacking empathy and being abrupt and cruel to someone. And um, um, well, that's certainly not what I do. I'm an empathic and sensitive sort of a guy. And uh, 
you know, I'm very compassionate and, and emotionally uh, fluid. And uh, when I see something like that, I want to kill the bastard. I don't just disapprove or don't just say, gee, well, I wonder why he's doing that. Or, you know, that's probably not what I do. I have this enormous sense of outrage, for example, hmm. about someone who has those qualities. Now, psychology would say, or Jungian psychology would say that when we've sensed that disproportionate reaction, that over the top reaction, that's the time, believe it or not, to say, okay, stop the, stop the presses. How is it that I'm overreacting? It must be that this exists in my unconscious, but I can't be aware of it and I can't let mm. myself feel it. Mm. Now that runs contrary to logic. You know, my, my logic says, no, that can't be right. It's exactly the opposite of what I feel. I hate it in other people. Why would I be, you know, uh, having it myself if I hate it so much in others? We have to go against that kind of logic and say, the truth of the matter is, the, dis the, the over the top reaction is an indicator that it is inside us and we can't bear to look at it properly. Mm. Uh, Chris, and by, Chris, go ahead, Doug, yeah. Uh, it's Roger, Chris. Um, oh, Roger, yep. Uh, is, is that overreaction in an unconscious or, or conscious mind? No, the overreaction is conscious. Mm. I don't know why or what, but I just know that I'm really outraged and incensed and want to do something about this person or that person or this characteristic. So that's what comes into consciousness, this, this ridiculously... Uh, powerful emotional reaction, but what is driving it is in the unconscious, and that's the shadow mm. material. Mm. So the process is um, five of us are standing in a group, a person walks by and spits on the pavement, everybody goes, oh God, I go, I'm going to prosecute that guy, that's illegal. In fact, I think I'll make a citizen's arrest. What the hell does he think he's doing? So for the four other people, it's just, you know, gross. For me, it's a total outrage. Mm. Again, there's something in there that affects me more than others. So I have to take this kind of self-inquiry line, which uh, at first is um, ridiculous, and saying, well, how is it? That, how can I be like this? How, where is this inside me, this gross behaviour? Uh, and, and, and begin the process of looking carefully at ourselves. So this is the process and of self-inquiry, It is a process of being open. Being open to observing yourself. Exactly. And the, mm. but the the terms of the inquiry are given by the, by our response. You know, I hate cruelty, I hate arrogance, I hate self self assertive guys, I hate it, you know, what whatever it is. Um, that's the that's the terms of the Royal Commission. And the, then the inquiry <laughs> is how can I be like this? Mm. How could I possibly and to our surprise and perhaps to our consternation we find that we can be like this. In fact, we might have been like this from time to time if we'd given ourselves half a chance. Or the last time we had too many whiskies, we were like this, but it was only the alcohol talking, it's not us. Mm. Or what, whatever rationalisation there is. See, so, Chris, and that's, that's an interesting example where I've seen people who you know, are mild-mannered in their daily activities and mm. they um, you know, get drunk or you know, whatever. Um, and loose they act out in the bonds, yeah. yeah, and they behave in a way that's you may not have seen before, or that is surprising. Well, to observe in that particular person, it's been carefully, it's been carefully uh, uh, disguised, Dave, and, and mm. suppressed even from the person themselves. And it's only when you, you know, if you do something like you get a concussion, or you get an alcoholic concussion, or some description, <laughs> and the defences are temporarily suspended that this stuff may uh, pop out. Now, f for many men, um, uh, a lot of it's to do with rage and yeah. aggression. Um, uh, we don't have to go past that to see, uh, but there are, you know, there are refinements of this and, and sexual matters too. These are the instincts that Freud spoke about 150 years ago. Freud obviously, you know, is a, is a dead white male, there's no doubt about that, but he wasn't completely off track. Mm. Our instincts are um, uh, historically our instincts come from that part of us which is closer to the animal than it is to the god. Mm. You know, if you look at, if you look at uh, animal behaviour, the the behaviour of territoriality, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, com competitiveness, 
self-preservation, herd instinct. We have these instincts. They've been tempered and moderated and become more sophisticated over time and suppressed and curtailed and so on. But those instincts are part of us. It's not to say that we are um, animalistic. It's to say that we have a pretty thin skin when it comes to the instincts, but we've been told over and over again not to engage and indulge in them. Hmm. And where do they go? They go underground and one fine day you wake up and you've got a bloke on the ground and you're strangling it. How did that happen? Well, the beast got out. You know, this is the danger of shadow. Now it shows up relationally in our, you know, as I say, with the people that we love who, um, because we feel more secure with um, and more vulnerable with, actually unconsciously, inadvertently encourage this behaviour. That is, I feel happy enough with her so I can give her a hard time. Mm. Even though I love her, unquote, the way my dad loved my mum and gave her a hard time yeah. forever. Did you so, mean you're like, so I let my guard down? Yes. Mm. That's right. Uh, and it usually happens with people who are closer to us than strangers mm. um, because, because we, uh, uh, something in us relaxes. So our natural protectiveness relaxes. Uh, Chris, uh, yeah. it's yes. like me. Uh, our, our facilitators of the, our program say that uh, uh, the um, love brings up uh, anything unlike itself for the purpose of healing. And, and so, so that... So the the unlike itself is is the bloody rage and the shit and the uh, the anger and everything else coming into play. So is that is that is that what you're saying as well? Yes, that's another that that is another way of uh, of saying it. That that puts a frame around it of love, which is uh, a little less harsh than than the psychologist would say. You know that the shadow is a uh, is something that we really have to take care of, mm. but. Mm. The deal is that the more we become aware of shadow and the more we acknowledge it, the more love we're capable of. Mm. You know, if I'm sitting on my resentment uh, uh, and my insecurity 100% of the time, um, my capacity for love is diminished, particularly if the person who I'm in relationship with seems to have an uncanny way of irritating me in a thousand different ways, which is probably half true, but not completely true. So under those circumstances, um, there's not much capacity left for love. And if I do um, uh, exhibit love, it's through clenched teeth, unless mm. I can come to terms with my own darker side. And darker, you know, darker evil, no, darker, not in the light. Not so, so available. Are you saying, Chris, that um, in terms of relationships, as and just just drawing upon what Roger was saying, mm -hmm. so we we end up projecting our shadows onto the people that we love, um, amongst others. Yes, amongst others. Yes. Let's let's talk about that notion of projection, which is a psychological mm. term, but of course, yep. <clears throat> again in the in the common language, um, project projection Latin to throw forward, mm. to throw out to throw away, as distinct from interjection, which is, I'll have that, thanks, I'll take it into myself. Now, so, so I, I am a person who um, um, is uh, inclined, uh, as a, a small boy, I was inclined to be arrogant and unempathic. And my, um, uh, my new age father, um, in between rolling joints uh, was telling me how, you know, how unenlightened that behavior is and therefore I should be uh, soft, gentle, compassionate and empathic. So um, because I want to hang on to his love, I attempt to be like that. Uh, and my unempathic, self-assertive and sometimes arrogant aspect disappears into the tunnel of the unconscious. And so, um, I, uh, uh, you know, enter adult life and I marry and have kids and uh, um, uh, everything goes well, except that uh, I am forced into a corner constantly by provocation, in inverted commas, from my two smart kids and uh, um, my wife, who's, uh, who is really asking for more of me, yep. but more of me is not available because I'm sitting on this 
and eventually uh, what comes up is this uh, suppressed, arrogant, unempathic creature who uh, drives everyone away mm. um, um, because it explodes into consciousness rather than is accepted voluntarily and step by step into consciousness. So it's the explosion of shadow that is so destructive. And the projection is, well, you know, it's my wife's brother, actually. He is a trip. My wife's <laughs> he's the most arrogant, unempathic son of a bitch. You can imagine, no wonder I don't go to the Christmas parties. No wonder I keep the kids away from him. He's just satanic, you know. That does two things for me. That relieves the pressure that I have um, in me of trying to hide mm. my own arrogance and my own unempathic nature. And it gives me someone to blame righteously. There's nothing yeah. like righteous blame, is there? Mm. To satisfy the neurotic self, yeah? Mm. There they are, bastards, you know. <laughs> they're over <laughs> there. <laughs> That's right. Right, you know, they're either, they're either refugees mm, or gays mm, yep. or, or ethnic minorities uh, or uh, Department of uh, Social Services or accountants or the cops or, or accountants. Well, accountants, that's a different story. They, they are. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> that's right. So it, it's twofold. It relieves my inner pressure and gives me someone to enjoy blaming and, uh, and uh, putting at a distance. This is projection. Mm. To throw outwards onto something or someone else that which I can't bear in myself. This is, and what we do is project our shadow material, our mm. unconscious material. Now that's the that's the that's the situation, pretty much. Does that also apply, Chris, to um, what you might say is like a golden shadow? Now the you idea project onto up where you project that onto someone else. Yes, yes. The, Look at how the, wonderful that person is. Yep, they have all the qualities that that yeah. I would wish for, except that I'm a nerd and a dope yeah. and a moron. I, just don't know. I haven't got that. Yeah. That's right. Mm. Why? Because they've been uh, suppressed in me for whatever reason. And I'm just going to be a, a narrow conformist mm. uh, loser, uh, mm. like the family culture wanted me to be. And so the ideal um, uh, person comes along, or does, it doesn't even have to be ideal, they may have uh, certain qualities that I uh, wish for, but a bit more developed. And so they become my god, my mentor, um, my Svengali, you know, my guru and so on. Can you see mm. how uh, an incredible amount of influence can be exerted by someone who has uh, someone trailing around after them thinking that they're the guru because they have the qualities that have been suppressed in the individual. So that's one idea of golden shadow. The other idea of golden shadow uh, is that one, um, and, and this, come, this comes from many disciplines, one of them is uh, alchemy, the ancient art of alchemy, which is about taking lead uh, heavy, grey, uninteresting, heating it and various other processes and turning it into gold. That is that inside shadow, at the essence of shadow, is not always more darkness, but sometimes genuine qualities, genuine resources that we need. For example, I may be spending my life suppressing my aggression. Uh, because it's not a good thing and we all know that and my dad told me and you know he wasn't aggressive and he did all right and blah 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 but if I if I allow somehow by some process my aggression to show up then it may well be that it will transform or moderate into something which we could call assertive assertion or assertiveness so aggression fuck you I'm going to kill you might moderate into, listen, I'm standing here, I have my rights and I'm not going to let you walk over the top of me. Sorry about that, but I'm not going anywhere. Now, my assertiveness will be blocked too if it's covered by the shadow of aggression. I can't go there. I can't even be assertive because uh, I'm terrified that if I am, you know, I'll, I'll, uh, my aggression will take over. So you, can you see that, you know, at the bottom of some shadow material is... Uh, something that we need. And we may even need blatant aggression. If someone is kicking your door down, you know, in the middle of the night, well, you don't sort of necessarily welcome them in with compassion. You need to be able to meet that force with force. Mm. And at times aggression may be absolutely necessary. 
Mm. So if, in those two ways, Dave, the idea of golden shadow is there, which, which means that, you know, we can't perform a frontal lobotomy on shadow. We can't send it to the electric chair or legislate it out of existence or send it to offshore concentration camps. Yeah. We have to, we have to find a way to live with it. So in some respects, um, the way I'm perceiving this, Chris, is, you know, shadow is what's, what's filling your, your black bag that you're dragging behind you. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Which, you know, when, which is in the, in the general picture, everything that we're unconscious of. Yeah. But, we, yeah. but yet is connected to us. Mm. Mm. Precisely. Mm. And, you know, and we have to start somewhere, as I said, with the stuff that we know about ourselves and then the stuff that we dream about or the stuff that we, that, that uh, has a see red in, in the world mm. out there, mm. other people's behavior. Often enough, just briefly on dreams, shadow material often shows up in dreams yeah. um, um, as, a, as a relative of the same gender, of a schoolmate of the same gender, usually of the same gender, of um, a dark figure, of a person who uh, is clearly present, but whose face is in darkness and unrecognisable, but yet the person is somehow familiar. So if you have dreams like this, particularly if you have more than one, you're probably looking at shadow material. Mm -hmm. if, I could, if I could give you a, a, small, a short example of that, I won't take too much time. Mm -hmm. um, my young brother, Greg, is deceased now. Um, eight years younger than me, um, we had a sort of a, uh, you know, a, a reasonably tense relationship. Um, for, um, and one of, one of the things that I um, thought about him was that he was, um, he was slack and unreliable, you know, that, you know, he'd never get back to you and, and uh, he wouldn't tell you what's going on until you found out later and, he wouldn't tell you the full truth and he was a pain in the ass generally and you know like that um so i had a dream when i was working with a, a Jungian therapist this is many years ago now had a dream in which i was uh, i was um holding the the handles of a of an old-fashioned wooden plow and i was uh, a bullock pulling it and i was plowing a field and when i looked down underneath me under the ground um, in exactly the same position upside down was my brother also being pulled along by a bullock holding onto a plough. So here's someone who is closely related to me, who is doing the same thing that I'm doing, but it is under the ground, under consciousness. And so working with this dream, that is, um, this is my double. This is my this is my other. He's he's my brother, and he's doing the same thing. How is it that, um, that I can see the, what's above the ground, but not what's under the ground? And it didn't take long before I engaged in a self inquiry. I was in the therapeutic situation at the time. How could I be like my brother? No way. <laughs> I'm reliable. You know, I get back to people. What are you talking about? Doesn't take long though to see. Hmm. Well, I'm reliable when it suits me, you know, and I'm reliable with people I like, and I'm reliable if I'm not put on the spot. But, you know, if I am put on the spot, I'm probably going to tell a porky or two to get out from underneath, or maybe I just, you know, blah, blah, blah. This is my shadow. This is a dream which represents my shadow. This is the kind of dream. Um, when if you have someone like this shows up in your dream, your first question is, who is, you know, who does, who is this person? What are his characteristics? Well, he's a thief and a drunk. Great. That's a good start. Now, in what way can I be uh, ever categorised, self-categorised as a thief and a drunk? Well, I can't. I'm better than that. Oh, really? What about blah, blah, blah? What about the stuff you're stealing from yourself by ne never giving yourself an even break? What about the, you know, the... Uh, the untruths you tell to the people of your, your bosses, so you'll get a promotion, blah, blah, blah. This is the way we work with dreams and, and shadow. So dreams can be very helpful too. Dreams are a um, pretty potent resource, aren't they? They are. Mm. They are. Uh, I've, um, I've been in contact with the ideas of dreams for quite a long time. Uh, I 
facilitate until recent times uh, two dream groups uh, mm. and we work uh, regularly with dreams. I think they're a, a superb resource mm. Mm. because they, they don't necessarily tell the truth, capital T, but they tell another truth. Mm. The conscious mind tells the truth of the situation as we, as it sees it. The mm. dreams tell us, you know, uh, the, the truth of the situation from below the waterline, looking up yeah. at the ship rather than looking down. Yeah. yeah Chris, yeah. Chris, can I just, one of the guys just uh, made a question in, in the chat. It's from mm. Ewing. Um, it's a, it's a couple of double whammy of a question. I think Are right. projections only bad. That's the first part. And yes. is it, is it, possible to project in a way which is healthy and workable for instance acknowledging someone's act of service to humanity isn't that a projection of an honorable value yes um the, f the answer to the first uh, question is um projections aren't always negative they can be positive and idealistic certainly secondly there's a difference between acknowledging someone's behavior and elevating their behavior uh, to uh, ridiculous heights at my own expense. Mm -hmm. If someone performs a service to humanity, of course, of course, they're worth acknowledging. And it's a great thing. And that it may be a great encouragement to us to also help out uh, mm -hmm. and, and to be led by positive example. No doubt about that. And so projections can be po uh, projections can be um, or realizations can be helpful. Projections, though, are I'm giving it to you, but it really belongs to me yeah. and I can't acknowledge it. So, you know, what I put on the other person is at my expense. That's different from saying that was great. Mm. That's a, that's an acknowledgement. Mm. Of course, we're able to say that. But if, but if someone, if you say it about someone, he's always been great. He's always been amazing. I just don't know how he does it. I certainly wouldn't have those skills. I could never have that commitment. Mm. I could never have that courage. How brilliant he is. And in fact, you know, that sort of acknowledgement is at my expense. That's, mm. a, that's a projection, even if the projection is about someone who's done a good thing mm. or something which is, uh, you know, seen as good. Uh, Chris, I've got a question about the black bag. Mm -hmm. um, where, where do we start it and where do we end it? I mean, obviously, we're trying to discard the drop it away, uh, you know, take stuff out of the bag or, or, sorry, identify it and work out what the hell to do with it. Um, you know, is that a... Is that a is that a self fulfilling bag, or is it you know you pull one out and you drop another one in if you, you haven't been careful about how you're treating yourself or others and stuff? Is that you know is it a is it a bag that ever empties? <laughs> <laughs> I'll swap your bags, Roger. <laughs> um, from a spiritual perspective, from the from the traditional spiritual disciplines, the sh the bag doesn't end until we become fully enlightened, yeah. um, quote unquote. Mm -hmm. Now, you know that terminology is a little difficult for us, twenty uh, first century Western paradigm. But um, what I guess they're saying is that theoretically there is an end to uh, to, sh to carrying shadow material, um, but that end requires that we elevate our identity out of uh, the, the purely human into some kind of transcendent identity where we are as much divine as we are human. Um, but for our purposes, in terms of psychological growth, my, my feeling is that when we break the crust of shadow and we realize that a shadow exists, uh, B, it's getting in the way. C, that we only we we can work with it by constant vigilance. Mm -hmm. When we break that crust, then things become easier. Uh, they become harder at first, mm -hmm. and then they become easier because part of our um, uh, resource kit is just to notice when things plug us in and immediately get onto them, see how they're relevant to us, and resolve them and move on. Mm -hmm. Mm. Uh, but I don't think I don't think that you know shadow ends at the end of the financial year for most of us. <laughs> I think it has. Or, you know, I think it has a longer. Of, or the end of coronavirus, or something. Or the end of coronavirus, which mm. I've got a couple what, other questions. Dave, is that okay? Just from I think Chris Rich. Yeah, go for it. Yeah. Uh, does uh, Chris? This is to you, Chris. From from Chris, um, does projection explain why we often hero worship famous pe people? Uh, for for example, sports guys. 
it can explain that absolutely that's the idealizing of of people yeah it's it's the and you know we're we're entitled to be thrilled by people by others who do great things it seems to me that's yeah. human yeah. you know if you see someone who's committed and skilled and lucky and hard working and they they entertain us with magical performances that seems yeah. to me to be pretty human yeah. but again it's the it's the sense of um uh, there's never a sense that I could be a hero like that to myself or in my group or in my family, or I could embody those qualities of commitment and hard work and skill. Mm. It's at the, my expense, that hero worshipping. That's when it's problematic. Yeah. I don't have to do it. I could never do it. So just another one. Thanks, Chris, uh, on behalf of Chris R. Uh, yes. From uh, Brucey Bramwell up in northern um, Queensland. Uh -huh. uh, wouldn't wouldn't the black bag uh, become useful when we consciously place something in, into it? Would the black bag be useful well, if we well, consciously? Well, wouldn't, wouldn't it be become useful when when we consciously place something into it? I'd rather carry it on my back or on the front than I'd to drag it along on the ground behind me to tell you the, tell you the truth, Bruce. That is, if I can, you know, my sense of integrating shadow. If we, if we're talking about taking on board shadow. My sense is, if I can say, I am capable of that. Not that I have to do it, act it out or be like that. I don't have to be an arrogant son of a gun. But I could, if I can say to myself, legitimately and truthfully, I get it. I could be arrogant. You know, I may not have demonstrated it a lot in my life. But yeah, sure, I could be unempathic. I can imagine me being cruel. That can be part of me. Um, then that's an integration. That's more like putting it in the, putting it in my pocket. But to to put it in the black bag seems to me to be adding to something rather than taking it away. Um, you know, uh, there's a difference between making a decision not to act something out, and making and making a decision that I, that is never going to be a part of me, and it never was a part of me. I can I can sort of. Uh, you know, someone, so I'm in a very bad mood. I'm so forth. And, so forth. and um, you know, my resources, are, my defences are pretty low. Someone provokes me. I have a string of fantasies that, you know, I wouldn't really write to my mum about. Um, but that doesn't mean I'm going to enact them. It means that, you know, my images and, and fanciful dialogues and whatnot come up because I'm provoked and, you know, I haven't... Uh, been able to release this part of my shadow and so here it is but it doesn't mean i have to go and do something mm. is that you know we draw a line between allowing something to show up in consciousness by fantasy or drawing or writing or or you know or imagine dialogue or mucking around and taking it seriously and going going and and, act, and, and doing something so mm. um we're we're entitled to allow this stuff to come up and then, and then the necessity is to say, yep, that's me. Yep, you know, in a, in a world where nothing matters, I would, I would put that guy through a mulcher and, you know, <laughs> scatter him over my rose garden. Sure. Not that I'm going to do it, but that could be, that could be a fantasy. That's the mm -hmm. way of uh, holding shadow. Mm -hmm. And, of course, it gives you much more compassion, not only for yourself, but those, people, those of us who are destined or... Uh, unfortunately forced to acting it out but to put it in to put it in the bag to add to shadow mm, i think there's probably more there's better ways of doing it quick questions from uh sorry this, to grab the others uh, from axel our resident physicist yes, uh, axel, yes. Uh, isn't what's in the bag in in in, in or what's in the sh in the shadow everything we are attached to or and cannot do without and, and when you used enlightened, yes. um, which obviously is non-attachment, yes. um, uh, you know, can we project anything if we're not attached to it? Um, I, I, I sort of changed a bit of the question there on axles, but, but probably the first bit, you know, is, 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 is the, what's in the bag everything uh, we're attached to and can't do with that? I think that's a yes and no answer. I think that in the bag, out of sight, 
uh, unacknowledged, fertilized by unconsciousness, uh, we're not attached to it. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, I think that's a, that's a, that's a hyper concentrated distortion of something which might, we might be attached to. Mm. Um, I think that if shadow was, you know, it, let's say my violence was brought into the light and it was moderated and became um, protest and assertiveness uh, and uh, uh, being able to see the difference between what is right for me and what's wrong for me, discrimination, then I think that we would be attached to that uh, in, a, in a human way. But I don't think we're, uh, I don't think we need to be attached to, um, to the extremely distorted and perverted manifestations of shadow because we've never looked at it. I think it's stuck to us. I don't think we're stuck to it. I think that if we bring it forward and have a look at it uh, and it moderates, then we become more human. And, and while we're in human form, uh, and enlightened or unenlightened, I don't like using that word, it has too much baggage. Um, while we're in human form, we're entitled to, to, to have those attachments, but not in terms of shadow, which is, uh, which is a very uh, lurid distortion of what's actually there because mm. it hasn't been examined. Mm. So, uh, actually, we've got it. Thanks, Chris. Uh, just to pick up a couple other ones here, the, um, our resident school teacher, uh, Sam, uh, uh, sums it up by just saying humans are fucked up. So, that's what he, that's how he described. He didn't have a question there. So, yes. So, so uh, that's probably, a, you know, I don't know. Well, it's, a it's a reasonable it's statement. I, I mean, the idea that to be human is to be in an embarrassing situation yeah, is probably the gentle way of saying that. Be another way of saying it. It's, it's what, what he teaches at school, I think, at uh, where, <laughs> wherever you are. So. Um, the, uh, Andrew uh, Bear had another one, a question, are daydreams the same concept uh, with our subconscious? Um, somewhat. Somewhat. Uh, the, you know, the difference between a dream, say, and a daydream is that in a daydream, of course, we have more conscious control. Yeah. That is that I might have a, a fantasy about, wouldn't it be nice if this virus was over and I could actually take that trip to Italy that I've been saving yeah. for three years. And yeah. here I am now in the villa looking out, you know, over the mountains and, oh, it's a beautiful Chianti and, you know, lovely to have seasonal wine and off I go and so on and so forth. Um, it's a fantasy. Um, and it's a product of the imagination. We are creating images, which, uh, which we like or don't like. Um, but so it comes from the imaginal world or the world of imagination, but there's a conscious shaping, you know, uh, to it. Yeah. Yeah. With dreams, of course, the, the conscious mind is completely suspended temporally. And what comes up, comes up very spontaneously and involuntarily and we have no management of its shape or the cast of characters or the plot. So it's, it's less voluntary. Um, but um, daydreaming certainly comes from that realm um, of the unconscious. And many psychologists, well, some psychologists have, have made a, a point of, uh, of uh, working with daydreams and fantasies because they, they're often compensatory. Mm. I don't know mm. if anyone's ever um, done a, a, a a fast, a juice fast, or a water fast, any, you know, whatever. Um, you know, in my in, in, in a previous incarnation, a slimmer <laughs> incarnation, I was uh, I was into fasting many years ago, and uh, you know, if it was a five day fast, I would probably spend the last day and a half planning my first meal. Um, you know, it's compensatory. <laughs> that is, I'm hungry. You know, and I had three grains of brown rice twelve hours ago. That didn't do it for me. Um, mm. So the menu becomes more elaborate as I plan my meal. This is this is imagination, but it's it's compensatory. That is, it's compensating for a current condition. Uh, dreams don't necessarily do that. They may stand by themselves. Sometimes they compensate. Other times they don't. So, yes, it is daydreams are, but it has they have other uh, shapes and characteristics from a dream. It's, uh, we're putting on in time. Just one question from Steve Len Lennon. Um, uh, does it take some personal type of, uh, sorry, does it take some type of personal trauma to acknowledge the size of the black bag and, and in, in particular what's been su suppressed over many years? Yes. Uh, I, that's, that's, a, that's an interesting question. Often it does. You know, often it does. We, uh, it, look, if, if, for whatever reasons we are embarked on a genuine quest for self-development, 
if you know if there's a if there's a strong interior demand to grow um then i don't think we need a personal trauma i think that you know as part of as part of the demands that the unconscious makes we will find uh literature or groups or information which will allow us to examine this but uh if that's not the case i think a shock or a trauma is required you know in in my life i have, I have to say that um the first half of my life almost everything i did and i did a lot of personal development which included you know traveling living in england the therapeutic groups and you know ashrams and all sorts of different things and, and body work you know this you know the list it was because i was in pain you know i was in emotional pain psychological pain physically i was okay um but emotionally i was just in 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 agony mm. and it was a driver um and um uh, i just went from you know one first aid station to another trying to solve the the issue of quote my pain and i had no i had no choice really because of the because of the intensity of the experiences that i was suffering um and there came a time i you know i can't remember exactly but i remember the event but not the date in which one fine day i i sort of woke up uh and i realized that today i have a choice today i can just sink back into the old uh, blood stained t-shirt or i can take a step forward and for the first time in my life i was probably 30 in my mid 30s i realized i thought i had a choice and that was a turning point um for me in uh personal development because i now was able to to some degree not be compelled to run from one station to another but to start up have start to have some management on what i did and the second time that happened to me was that you know i was living in london in the 80s and we spent a lot of time beating cushions and screaming primarily and you know using a lot of more tissues than was decent um and you know really slogging and flogging away at our pain and um then i came came in contact with a spiritual teacher and a spiritual movement and meditation i was you know this was in the uh, where are we late mid 70s um and after a, a short time of sort of uh, being engaged with this energy and also doing some meditation i found that the pain that i was carrying was vanishing without having to <clears throat> punch a cushion or bleed cathartically that there was some methodology which enabled stress and pain and heaviness and weight to lift from me without having to beat it out with a stick and that was the second turning point that is there were resources available to me which meant that i could lighten my load without having to drag the egg and drag the black bag out and yes. spill it out all over the mattress mm. the 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 question from ewing um sort of follows on from that um so if the black bag is um i guess largely unknown i suppose that's an assumption um what we what we don't know so we don't know what we don't know what what yes. what's the process to start uncovering what's in the black bag and and is it a realistic goal to to empty it totally before you uh i mean i mean you said mentioned the enlightenment before but or, or, you know what is there a pro what's the starting process you you sort of shared that then actually um, and Ewing sent the question before that but um you, your process of tr starting to empty the bag was was quite unique to you wasn't it that's right well i think the starting starting place is to realize you're unhappy yeah and you're incomplete yeah that you know that there's there's plenty of potential but uh, the wheels are spinning and you're not going anywhere or you're not going anywhere fast and also you're just not happy and secondly that there's a pattern of unhappiness that you know your relationships last uh, an average of 10 months or you can't stay in a job or um you ga you gather interest and become passionately engaged with them and then they become boring really quickly or every time you're about to start a new enterprise you break your leg mm. or you drink too much at crucial times so you know i'm unfulfilled and i'm unhappy that's a 
that's a place where we could all find, I'm sure. In my case, Chris, the, you know, when I started the, the group with Dave, the, uh, about 46 or 40, even a couple of years before that, though, um, I mean, I was full of shit and an arrogant prick and probably still am, <laughs> like some of the guys might say. But, um, but essentially, the bag was so fucking big at that point. It's sort of like that crisis had to happen. The, the, the bag was so damn full uh, and the realisation that I, I was just uh, a mess and, and going on the, starting the, you know, the personal development was a, was a starting point, I guess. And, yeah. and, and, and the, the bag is probably still hanging around too, because it was so big up until it was when I was 46. So what, without, without chapter and verse necessarily, Roger, what was, what was the mess that you were in? Were you just unhappy or you were failing in certain areas that you didn't want to fail in or what was it? What was it? How do you, would you define the mess? Uh, Oh, look, a mixture of a few things, emotional, emotional mess and financial mess. Right, uh, yeah. You know, a mixture of those two things. Yeah. Um, yep. un unhappy in the marriage, you yeah. know, an, an unconscious, uh, unemotional woman, uh, yeah. you know, which yeah. is not me. So, so but yeah, I well, that's, probably blame that's, her. Yeah. That's the two areas that we normally uh, come to terms with. And, you know, as... As men, we can cover those we can cover those wounds successfully for the you know for quite a while because we can submerge ourselves in the stream of achievement that society wishes for us, and that our forebears wished for us, and we can achieve some of the markers of success. You know, we can have a successful persona. You know, we can have a personal trainer that uh, we send our kids to private schools and, and look good. We can do that for a while. But there comes a time, and Dave sort of said maybe midlife, and in, you know, midlife seems to happen earlier and earlier these these days, yeah, where okay. you know yeah. if we take a deep breath and sit in a room with the light off for ten minutes, we realise that we've got a lot apparently, but we are just not happy. And mm. not only are we not happy, but we have no idea who we are. We're some kind of a cipher or some kind of a, a piece of wood in a fast flowing stream, which uh, is relentless and merciless. But while we're in the middle of it, we look okay. But the minute we get out of center stream, we get washed up on a shore and left behind. It doesn't take there's, there's, there's something in that about that, that question that everyone has inside somewhere. No, I yeah. think there's a, most people, you know, have that sense of there's a question somewhere. And I, I recall actually when I met Rog at um, Man's Inner Journey 20 odd years ago, mm. um, someone asked me the question, why are you here? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's a powerful question. Yes. <laughs> and I, I, I do recall saying, you know, job and the house and, you know, paid lots yeah. of money and all that crap, but yeah. there's, there's, there's got to be something else. <laughs> yeah. You know? Yeah. There was yeah. a sense of inquiry that there's, there's, there's something not right. Mm. You know, there's something missing yes mm. you think there's a um, there's a great uh, great book that uh, is uh, recently around which is to, to do with grief and loss the, the wild dance of sorrow does anyone come across that book yeah the wild dance of sorrow dave you have worth a look it talks about the five gates of sorrow mm. um and we, we don't have time to go into them now but the first gate of sorrow and grief is everything that we love we will lose and, you know, we could stop right there. Mm. Um, but there are other gates. And the second gate is um, the loss of everything that we felt we deserved but never got. Mm. Everything that we felt we deserved but never got. Now, we can be psychological and sort of say, you know, mother's love and father's love, and that's absolutely true. But let's take it sort of slightly more existentially and say, We've come into this world with a kind of promise. Now, some of that promise is conditioned. That is the promise that my grandfather is a doctor and so is my dad and therefore I'm, I'm going to be driving a Bentley anytime now, anytime soon and saving souls. But it's more than that. It's a, to be human is to come in, it seems to me, with a promise that something can happen 
some some ideal some satisfaction some a, attainment not in the material world and for so many of us we are disappointed because that promise hasn't occurred mm -hmm. that promise hasn't been honored by life by god by the gods and you can subdivide the gods as far mm -hmm. as you want to and turn it into you know human services if you want to but some kind of a promise hasn't been honored something inside us says that and that is a that is a loss and that causes grief and disappointment yeah. and if we can feel that accurately that becomes a driver to well is there any way of finding this and the first thing that we notice when we engage in that inquiry is what the heck is this you know, three and a half ton bag that I'm dragging along yeah. behind me, which is slowing me down enormously and exhausting me. Mm. What is it? Mm. And then we can start to get a sense of, uh, of uh, you know, what shadow might be and what this bag is. Mm. Mm. Do you think? Do you think at the at the moment, Chris? Uh, obviously, a lot of us, you know, a lot of the guys are isolated. And do you think there's a, you know, on a positive note, there's an opportunity to to find that that sense of each other when when you're in the, you're in the, you're in the, you know, you, I mean, I suppose it's changing a little bit, but do you think, I, you know, being alone or connecting to yourself, that's when you test yourself out about how, how well you know yourself and how, how you know, even if you know whether you've got a bag, you're dragging it along, you know, yeah. what, what is it that's, that's going to, it's going to come up into your face when you're by yourself. Um, Without a doubt, without a doubt, this this last couple of months has caused a lot of um, a lot of uh, negative social issues to arise. Roger, in terms of um, alcohol consumption, domestic violence, uh, suicide uh, attempts, and, and suicides that work succeed, all of those things are up. But also, from our perspective, the perspective of the men uh, sitting here now who are not, uh, I would imagine, engaged in that that kind of um, uh, defensive manoeuvre, um, all of us, I would think, would feel that we are thrown upon ourselves now. Mm. Um, you know, we have time. Um, we have, uh, we can't travel long distances distractedly. We can't work in the same compulsive way that we used to. We can't have uh, a network of um, power-seeking relationships the way we used to. It's an enormous opportunity. And I think uh, without sort of being active about it, all of us would appreciate that we uh, we are in a different, a deeper place with ourselves now than we were in February, mm. you know, and we do know ourselves better. Mm. Um, you know, there are collateral advantages. The number of men I've heard who say, look, um, my daughter loves me. We've had such a great time in the last three weeks or I'm getting on so well with my wife, you know, we're cooking together, we're walking together, we're relating together. There's been a tr already a tremendous upsurge in, in deflating this ridiculous social and work ethic ego that we've been forced into, deflating it down to human proportions and saying, listen, I'm just a bloke. And, you know, there are things that I like and things that I don't like. And in this time, I can get some sort of distinction between the two and perhaps work to enhance the one and work to minimise or integrate the other. Definitely an opportunity. I, I mean, think, Chris, too, what's interesting to me mm -hmm. is that within that context of, as Rod talked about, the, you know, this COVID-19 era and having, possibly having more time you know, to self-reflect and, and examine and self-inquire. You know, um, the fact that we have 40-odd people online tonight is is a, um, an indicator of that uh, desire for, you know, perhaps self-inquiry or, you know, moving into that space at least. Yes. Otherwise, we wouldn't be online. That's right. That's right. Abs absolutely true. People, you know, there is a demand. There is a demand out there. And what is that demand for? That demand, it seems to me, is for, um, um, in some cases, it's a substitute structure. You know, I haven't got yeah. the work structure, so I'll just, uh, you know, just get on YouTube and listen to every, every expert in inverted commas that opens his mouth. That's part of it. But another part of it is, um, is there any way of giving shape and substance to the self-inquiry that I have been 
inadvertently engaged in for the last couple of months. You know, something's happening to me, something's happening to the work ethic, something's happening to the planet. What the hell is it? Does anybody else feel it? Is there any way we can put words to it? Does anyone else spoken about it before historically, spiritually, psychologically, in terms of personal development, in terms of gender? Um, and so there is a demand for a shared experience and shared information, not from experts. You know, I, I follow YouTube and, you know, I've got a couple of guys that I follow, but I could spend 24 hours a day uh, getting, getting contradictory information and have a psychotic break in it by Wednesday. You know, really, if I was to completely externalise my sources of information, it's not about that. It's about shared experience with some kind of a structure, it seems to me and a minimum of information, but a maximum of um, capacity to hold an inquiry and permission, permission to hold an inquiry, go deeper, you know, go deeper, even if it's unpleasant, go deeper. You know? Yeah. And that's, you know, for me, that's a, um, well, I see the, you know, our men's group structure as a vehicle for opening up some of those doorways or pathways for people to go deeper. Yes. Um, yes. Not in necessarily in the men's group structure itself, but as a way of um, guiding, perhaps, and nuancing those pathways that people take and um, having it as a checkpoint or, or clearinghouse in, in many respects around yes. that personal journey that we're all on, we're all taking. Yes. Um, you know, some are diving in deeper than others at different times. Yes. You know, it's, a, it's a personal journey, of course. Yes. And you've got to go where you've got to go at the right time for you. Yeah. Um, that's, you know, the fact that we have that available to us is, is a, a great resource to, 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 to be leveraging, I suspect. Incredibly. I mean, how else could we, we get a paid holiday or, you know, a, a paid time out? There's no other. We couldn't have done it voluntarily mm. at this point in time. You know, Jung, Jung spoke about a process, Dave, and, and, and others that he called the process of individuation. Yeah. And uh, the process of individuation is not about, you know, becoming an individual in the old fashioned sense. It is about becoming myself. That is yep. um, an acorn becomes an oak tree. You know, a mango seed becomes a mango tree. You become yourself as best uh, you can be. And the emphasis is not on perfection, which is what this society has been about, you know, perfect achievement, perfect material success. It's, crap. it's not about, hmm. it's about wholeness. Hmm. Yep. Not about perfection. It's exactly what it is. Which yeah. is to be the heroic top of the pile. It's about wholeness being all that you can be. Yeah. And, and for, for Christian, it's completely different, a completely different tree from, from Rob and from Peter, but it's, mm. it's a whole tree. And that's our, that's our process. I'm very interested in that, that, that you said that because, you know, I've been doing quite a bit of work personally with um, the Animus Valley Institute and yeah. Plotkin and his crew, that's precisely what they're on about. It's about holding the individual, W-H-O-L-L-I-N-G. Beautiful. And, um, and it's, as you said at the start of the session, you know, we, we, we come into the world with a whole set of capacities that um, many of which are suppressed. Yes. by our family experience and by our culture and yes. by the nature of our society and our extractive, you know, consumer-based culture that um, suppresses many of the natural dimensions and capacities that we have. Indeed. You know, Plotkin talks about something called the wild indigenous one. Wow. In all of us. Yes. You know, that capacity within ourselves for in indigenous wildness and connection to the land and our eros and our sexuality and... Yes. and um, and embracing and in, in you know wholly embracing those dimensions of ourselves that our culture suppresses. Yes, and that that talks to that question of you know you know uh, opening up those capacities that are that that have come naturally to us. Absolutely. So, mm. I mean, and I think we can talk about the distinction between wildness and savagery. Yes, precisely. You know, wildness, that incredible passion that we, you know, that drives us through the thing. Yeah. wheat fields, you know, uh, versus savagery, which is what happens when it gets yeah. suppressed. Yeah. yeah. And when it shows up, it shows up with cruelty mm. and violence. Mm. Mm. Um, you know, primitive savages, that's how we've regarded the indigenous peoples for thousands of years. Savages, 
really? Let's talk about primitive wildness and connection mm. these days with plant medicines and indigenous healing methodologies and so on and so forth. Savage? Mm. Savage is a judgment. And it's a yes. judgment that we, we perform on ourselves whenever we find that our instincts are r uh, running in the red and we've lost conscious control yeah. momentarily. Mm. You know, mm. our, our joy or our passion or our excitement is just transcends our control. Mm. That's, that's mm. wildness. Mm. Savagery is when we say we can't do that. Let's just put it underground and yeah. I'll beat someone up later. Probably <laughs> myself. Yeah, just to, um, just, to, to, just looking at the time, just to um, get to a point of, of conclusion, uh, I just have another, there's another comment that's come through from Ewing, which is an interesting comment around the black bag, but it, it, also in the context of you know, in the COVID-19, you know, period, yes. it, Ewing talks about the black bag of individuals, the black bag of culture, the black bag of governments and our society more broadly. Yes. It's the collective black bag in many respects, I guess. And um, I suppose those play out uh, when currently yes. at the, there's the individual and then there's the collective and, you know, the broader black bag, I guess, that we're all navigating as, within. As broad as you like. I mean, the, yeah. a classic rendition of that, of course, is the Nazi Jewish situation. Mm. How did the Nazis uh, regard the Jewish people? Dark, swarthy, greedy, usurious, that is money hungry, and what did they want for themselves, the Nazis? Tall, blonde, blue-eyed, pure Aryan. White, not black. Mm. So what happens? Well, I want to get rid of the shadow. And the only way I can think of, uh, of not falling into it is to eradicate it. So mm. as a result, 7 million people die. So, you know, it can get, it's bigger than the individual. It can be family, of course, or tribe, or clique, or spiritual movement, or, na or nation, or group of nations mm. um, there's no doubt about it but you know the the the, the age old mechanism of um, being unsatisfied throwing out in front of us everything which is unbearable to us projecting it out and then er trying to eradicate it that's the old way mm. that's the way that's got us where we are which is cactus mm. uh, at the moment the new way is to say if there's darkness out there it must be a reflection of myself how can I identify that how can i bring it closer to me and form a relationship with it so that it's not so threatening mm. and then i can move on yeah very interesting chris rog do you have something to add before we finish up yeah well, there's one other question is from steve actually steve lennon um, it's sort of talking about the current state uh, chris you know with you know we, we've uh, a few of us have sort of you know, you, I, I guess there's two groups of three or four groups of people, you know, you either fall into a mess or you, or you look at in the current situation or you, or you're at the other end, um, really embracing, you know, your lives again and appreciating your lives and appreciating, you know, how to live differently. And so, so the, I, you know, generally the guys are, you know, in, in my experience from, from, you know, when we've been, experiencing this over the last couple of months you know there's been i, I generally i think there's a there's a recognition you know some of the guys are hurting but the you know there's an appreciation that there's there's um there's a group of uh guys that are really positive about each other and you know it's 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 such a it's such a blessing to to, you know, talk about a, a culture. We, this we're, we're a clique. Uh, you know, we're a we're a group of eleven hundred guys around Australia at the moment that are that are, are fighting a a battle of finding out what's in that back black bag. I think, and 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 doing it with the, with with such love and nurturing that um, you know that that I I don't think has been experienced anywhere in 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 my in my life. Right. Yes. And 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 it's it's tremendous. You know, it's tremendous to see. You know, the, yes. I think we. I mean, I'm not saying everyone's magically bloody sorted it out, but mm. but it, but at least you've got that that love and support of the guys. Uh, you know, anyone that comes online. You know, and and uh, we meet. So, so I think that's a tremendous way of, you know, minimising the mental health and the the well-being of uh, or improving the well-being of. of 
of men in particular going forward in in in, in this work we do. Without without a doubt, without a doubt, and, and a lot of and a lot of that depends on the kind of overarching vision that you know that we have of of ourselves and of the human condition. What's yeah. possible? What's possible for us as humans, as men? As, you know, as men in the 21st century, the possibilities are enormous. And mm. so, you know, the difficulties then become more possible to, to uh, transform. You know, if yeah. life is a sick, you know, if life is a sexually transmitted disease with a fatal outcome, uh, you know, then uh, that's one way of looking at things. Um, mm, but if, if life is an evolutionary path and we're now uh, doing some hard yards, in that path, it gives us so much more capacity for faith and compassion and endurance, Roger, mm. endurance. Mm. Yeah. And form yeah. gr supportive groups like this, you know, is, is a tremendous way of ensuring resilience. Mm. In, in these, yeah, and, these and endurance, yeah, absolutely. One of the things that, just referring back to one of the comments uh, Saab so made is that, you know, humans are fucked up. And um, I think that's true. And I think it's actually a, um, I'd put a, a word in front of that, the beautifully fucked up. <laughs> okay, yeah. You know, um, I think there's something to be said for acknowledging our um, our beauty and our fragility. Yes. And, yes. Um, you know, there's something, you know, something actually that I was, you know, went, I did a program recently on wrestling with grief a lot. Right. And coming through that process, one of the things I recognise is how beautiful it is. <laughs> yes. Um, and appreciating that within myself, you know. And that was something very different and new for me, yes. that appreciation and recognition. So, and it's very difficult um, to come to that without experiencing the grief. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's very hard to see the poignancy and the beauty of grief without mm. having gone on the journey. Mm. So, Chris, any final remarks before we finish up at nine o'clock? Not really. Um, look, you know, it's isn't it great to be talking to forty blokes and to, oh, and to fantastic have questions answered and. Uh, it's been you know, a pleasure for me to sort of think my own thoughts out loud and, uh, mm -hmm. and to have people uh, listening. So thank you very much for your attention. And um, um, let's do it again if it, if it yeah. comes to that or if other people, you know, want to, want to uh, do something similar. I think it's a great forum. Uh, would you, Chris, would you like me to share your contact details? Yeah, please do. I've got that here. So I'll do that yeah. as a part of the chat now. I'll just send that around to everyone. Yeah. But I was thinking too that it just seems like a no-brainer to me that in, using online in particular, um, that we, you know, it would seem like common sense for us to um, have another session on a particular topic, you know, or, you know, just to have another conversation and discuss and throw questions around and, um, you know, explore issues that are of relevance to blokes um who are on this journey um and uh yeah we'll, we'll do it again hopefully yeah so thank thanks chris yeah on behalf of the guys too uh, firstly to the guys thanks for uh, putting the questions in through through us i appreciate that and obviously you know it's having a bit of a process in all this is important too so so uh directing that um uh, chris uh, we we value your uh, contribution and, and support of the, the men's group over many years too totally. and, um, and and the, and the man's in a journey up in Hillsville so um, yeah we, we love you mate and uh, take it easy <laughs> thanks very much and, and back uh, to uh, contributions folks contributions are more than welcome yes indeed okay right guys up. thanks all right thanks Chris we'll right talk up. again talk again soon cheers go, go well folks thanks thanks man thank you Okay.